What's up, guys? Welcome to Kind of Funny Games Daily for Thursday, September 6, 2018, a.k.a. Spider-Man Eve. Dun, 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 dun. Such an exciting time for people. I cannot wait for everybody, all you beautiful people out there tonight at midnight or 9 p.m. Pacific time, whatever. I don't know how all this stuff works. You beautiful motherfuckers are going to be able to play one of the best games of the year. I hear that on Spider-Man Eve, Spider-Man lowers himself down your chimney using his webbing, delivers mm. a wives crack, to and up. then leaves a copy of Spider-Man consensually for the PlayStation 4 right there on your mantle and then mm -hmm. climbs up. He does this for all the good children of the world. If you don't have a free copy of Spider-Man tomorrow, that's probably proof that you were unworthy. Oh my God. Yeah, I think there's gonna be a lot of unworthy people out there. Uh, this is Kind of Funny Games Daily, each and every weekday right here on twitch.tv slash Kind of Funny Games. We get together to talk about all of the video game news that's going on in the industry. I'm Tim Geddes. This is Jared Petty. Doki you doki. can get the show on Twitch, watch live, or you can get it on YouTube to just watch whenever you want to. Or if you just want to listen, guess what? We're on podcast services around the globe. Just search for Kind of Funny Games Daily. Please leave a nice review. It means a lot to me, ya boy. Uh, housekeeping. Shirtless Spider-Man. The fan mail, the cover for the game. Where is it? <laughs> it's usually somewhere around here. I'm I don't know it. where it is. No okay. idea. It doesn't matter. Uh, you can go to patreon.com slash kind of funny games to get the free cover of shirtless Spider-Man for the PS4 that you can slide in there. Um, or if you want to get the official sexy glossy version, Ooh. the fan mail tier. Uh, is, is what, you, what you're looking for. Ooh, oh, there it is. Thanks, Just, cool, there we go. Is that what we're, we're advertising right there? That is exactly what we're advertising. A um, little bit more housekeeping. RTX London is next week. I will be there. Greg Miller will be there. Andy Cortez will be there. It's going to be a good time. The full schedule is not out yet. We do have a panel. We're on multiple panels. Um, I know that I am on a Let's Play panel. So is Greg. Okay. Uh, we are all also doing ours. We are doing a center stage thing at some point. Um, I think I'm on Always Open, which is going to be really fun. And Greg is on uh, one other panel that I, I don't know yet. Uh, but stay tuned. Keep an eye on our Twitters to, to see where you can find us. We're doing a whole bunch of stuff over there. Oh, we're going to be doing Glitch Please as well, me and Greg. Are you going to be doing a concert standing on top of the, the Rocks of Stonehenge, playing together as a band? No, but I really love how many times Stonehenge has been brought up in the last week you, uh, across our show. You got to bring Stonehenge up. It's mm -hmm. important. Yeah. Uh, you got it's it, Stonehenge is awesome. So you the great Eddie Izzard joke Stonehenge? about Stonehenge. You got the you got the the wonderful like lowered from the stage tiny Stonehenge and Spinal Tap. Stonehenge is great. Stonehenge. Uh, and today, actually, there's a thing going on. A really cool thing. There's a Jacksonville tribute stream uh, between five and six thirty p.m. Eastern time, which I guess would be two thirty and five thirty. No, that's totally wrong. Uh, <laughs> between 2.30 and 3.30 uh, Pacific time. Uh, Greg's going to be on that. You can watch it on twitch.tv slash EA Madden NFL. Uh, it is a tribute stream to the horrible events of the Jacksonville situation from a couple weeks ago, trying to raise some money to, to help some people. So go check out Greg there. And this episode is brought to you by Third Love, but we will talk about that later. For now, let's begin with what is and forever will be the Roper Report. It's time for some news. We have five news stories today. A baker's dozen. Uh, the first one, another sad thing. Like uh, The, the yeah. world's a harsh place, Jared. It uh, is. The Nintendo Direct that was supposed to be today has been postponed due to the powerful earthquake in Hokkaido, Japan. Uh, Nintendo decided to delay this week's planned Nintendo Direct. They will provide a new time and date in the near future. And they say thank you for your understanding. Obviously, things happen. Yeah. Video games are not the most important thing in the world. No, they're so, not. And uh, um, it's a serious quake. Uh, my understanding is people have been injured. Uh, and uh, they're Seven gonna, dead that I yeah. saw. And that's, uh, I mean, earthquakes are a very common thing in Japan, but this was a very severe one. Hokkaido is kind of Japanese Alaska. Uh, it's a, hmm. a, Yeah, it's the northernmost of the main islands and uh, uh, home of the Sapporo Snow Festival and other wonderful things. And But the quakes in Japan uh, of that magnitude are a very serious matter. 6.6 tears up infrastructure makes it very hard for anything to get done and they just have bigger things to deal with right now than games so if they'll get to that mm -hmm. um yeah i mean it's it's really sad news especially early this week with the the typhoon 
yeah. um, that happened over there too, and then that was another situation with with casualties. Um, and did you hear that randomly? Uh, the typhoon knocked off the N. I did. Of the I Nintendo. did see that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I did see that, and uh, I thought that was actually kind of funny. I'm glad that that uh, ah, there were no. I'm glad that when it came to Nintendo, that seems to be kind of the extent of the damage. Yeah. Um, but yeah, folks were hurt. Uh, bad things are. You know, I was I was there during the Fukushima Daiichi earthquake, and uh, I was actually on a bridge when that happened, and the bridge started swaying. Uh -huh. Which is actually good news. That's what's supposed to happen. Oh, but yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the bridge sways. That means it doesn't break. But let me tell you what: sitting in a parked car in a traffic jam on a swaying bridge oh my is God. That is sounds horrible. Not a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, my wife was cleaning out a refrigerator and a thing fell on her head. Like mm -hmm. that, things fall on you in earthquakes. It sucks. It's awful. Uh, we, obviously, we we care very much about the things that happen to our friends at Nintendo and and other places. And and I hope that. Uh, they're able to recover quickly in terms of infrastructure in their lives. But I, I'm genuinely quite sad about yeah, hearing definitely. this news. I, I know stuff like this happens. I will say I'm a bit surprised that they, they actually delayed it, especially it being a direct, which is a video package. So. Well, yeah, but don't forget that infrastructure damage in a, in a place like this is a big deal. Your power lines go down, your plumbing goes down, your, your video equipment goes down. Not only that, but you know, if, if you're trying to figure out if you're, you know, if somebody's trying to figure out if their brother-in-law or their husband is, you know, not answering their cell phone because a tower's down or because they're dead. You know, mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing that you don't know. And I remember that, for, again, from the the aftermath of Fukushima where people were just like, I don't know where people in my family are. Yeah. And I don't know if I can't reach them because communications are down or because they're not there to answer anymore. People need to put these priorities first. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm sure that in, in addition to it just being a direct, there is a lot that goes into it. Like from social support side PR that has to go out. Like when a direct happens, yes, it is just one video, but if there's 35 games in a direct, that means there's 35 different teams uh, working on getting the messaging out of those things, getting the screenshots, getting all that stuff out to other sites. So. And that's absolutely the right call because uh, oh, that, totally. that, they've had two national natural disasters and national tragedies within the course of a week. I, mm -hmm. I think it's time to take a breath. Yeah. Absolutely. Good call on Nintendo's part. Also, if this jackhammer outside the window yeah, does no, not I'm, stop. I'm so sorry if uh, if you guys can hear that, but it is very, very, very annoying. I'm worried about involved. our listeners. I'm more worried about the the headache that is beginning here it, yeah, and I'm gradually starting to, starting spreading across my skull. Yeah. Uh, Liam Dixon writes in and says, Hello, Tim and Jared. With Nintendo respectfully postponing their direct, do you believe we will see potential game leaks on major retailers' websites? <laughs> We've seen this recently with Walmart Canada leaking major E3 announcements ahead of time, and we know that many online retailers, such as Amazon, have placeholders for upcoming releases. So with this direct being postponed, could we maybe see Animal Crossing and the heavily rumored Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe get leaked due to the placeholders going up ahead of time? I doubt game-related news, such as new Smash Bros. characters or details on Pokemon Let's Go will leak, but I believe titles will inevitably happen. What do you guys think? Love all the work you guys do, and I really hope Jared is repping that hat today. Oh, <laughs> Much love from Glasgow, Scotland. I didn't wear the hat because uh, I'm still fairly freshly shorn. The hat comes on when I've forgotten to get my hair cut, uh, oh. but we're getting there. I'm getting mm -hmm. kind of kind of messy again here. Video game announcements uh, and launches are ridiculously complicated things. I think people have an idea sometimes on our end that there's like a central committee that controls all distribution. But when it comes to getting this kind of information out, different parts of multiple companies are involved, especially in the final stages. And there are just so many potential points of failure that the word may not get to in time. So many things locked, loaded, and ready for buttons to be pressed especially once it gets outside of Nintendo and into retailers' hands, that it's practically impossible to pull the reins back entirely at the 11th hour, mm -hmm. as we see here. Yes, uh, the next story on the Roku <laughs> Report. Uh, Yoshi name leaked via Twitter user, the OG EVG. Nintendo seems to have accidentally leaked the title of Yoshi's previously unnamed 2019 Switch game, Yoshi's Crafted World. Twitter user, the OG EVG, was perusing Nintendo's official website and looking at the Super Smash Brothers page when he spotted the apparent slip. At the bottom of the page, a suggested games tool pulled up a, a 2019 Switch game with the name Yoshi's Crafted World clearly displayed. Uh, Nintendo's went in and changed it, obviously, but I've seen the screenshot and I saw it down there. Makes sense as a name. Yep. Uh, you know, Yoshi's Woolly Worlds uh, came out on the, the Wii U and then had the port over to the 3DS. And from everything we've seen in this game, seems to be taking that aesthetic and bringing it into a bit more of a, um, uh Arts and craftsy vibe, like yep. as opposed to just being wool and buttons and stuff. No, it's kind of almost like some weird meeting between like Labo and and uh, and Yoshi. I got yeah. a strange place between those. I 
so I don't buy a lot of video game stuff. I buy a lot of video games, mm-hmm. but I don't actually buy a lot of video game adornments, decorations, etc. That I, I showed a tweeted a picture a few weeks ago of like a shelf in my house, but that's like a lifetime's worth of stuff there. Uh, however, Yarn Yoshi. Yarn Yoshi Amiibo was mm-hmm. a was a immediate purchase. Oh my god, he's so adorable. cute. Hold that on. thing's adorable. Keep talking. About so it. I want this. I want this to come out. I, I I I'm looking forward to a crafted world game. The more opportunities Yoshi gets to shine, the better because those games really do bring something kind of relaxed to to the world of video games. They they bring us a a kind of a ah sit back a little bit, take a deep breath. Oh look, there he is. Let I me mean, look at that. Look at that thing. Just who does not want that in their lives? It's amazing. It he really is. He's is. spectacular. I also, I love that they, they put him out in different colors, too. It's just like, sure, they know not, what's up. No, video games, he he and the Kirby Epic Yarn games, video games can be chill and mm-hmm. still fun. Yeah. And I like that Yoshi has kind of fallen into that place in Nintendo where, like, we're going to make a high quality, very pretty platformer where things are kind of chill. Here's, here's my thing. My thing about Yoshi. Yoshi's Island is mm. undeniably one of my favorite games of all time. First video game I ever beat. It holds a very special place in my heart. And it's one of those games that I, it's not just the nostalgia speaking. I can go back. I, that is a game that I go back and play once every couple of years. 100% it. That is the first video game you ever beat? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Okay, yeah. No, no wonder you love video games. Oh, yeah. It's a good one. And I feel it's a good one because the level design is yeah. just, it's 10 out of 10. It's on point. The, you know, Baby Mario is annoying and whatever, but it's like, the there was so much creativity in that game mm-hmm. from just boss designs to the way that the boss fights played out to just the look of it like the kind of you know uh coloring book aesthetic that yep. it had and i feel like we've lost that mm-hmm. magic in terms of design uh with 2d platformers especially in the mario series uh since then uh where everything's now just new super mario bros aesthetic and you're stuck in this like kind of lame plastic look Mm -hmm. you know Um, yeah i know you don't like the look of the new games Uh, no i think you and i agree that and i think they know that Mm -hmm. that that a a new look is going to be important for that series i mean you saw what they did with the 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 2d sections in odyssey you know like Mm -hmm. okay wait a minute they've got they got got, they they know something's up Yeah. yeah um but when it comes to yoshi it's like they they did give me exactly what i wanted which is a very uh, unique look like I guess it started with uh, Kirby's Epic Yarn but with what Yoshi's Wally World did like I love their decisions that they made uh, for Yoshi because it makes sense similar to Yoshi's Island the problem is the game doesn't hold up to mm-hmm. the the standards that Yoshi's Island oh did. no none of those games are nearly as good I mean they're they're fine games most of them they're but they're fine. not nearly as good as Yoshi's Wally's Island Wally's Wor- Wally World is it's fine it's I not a bad it. game but it is what you were saying it's it's chill it's it's simple it's not challenging well i want to be clear it's not the simple i'm worried about it's the chill because yoshi's island is chill Mm. that's that's yoshi's island is a ridiculously well-designed game but it's chill there's not a lot of high pressure screen to screen in yoshi's island you're in a lot of situations where you have to move quickly but you don't you aren't pushed into those Mm. it's like it's a bit more open and like it it uh incentivizes you to explore a exactly. bit more than like a traditional Mario platformer. I just feel like Woolly World is a little too loose. I, I think that if Yoshi's Island were released today as a brand new game, if, if it never existed before, and you took like a ROM hack to take Baby Mario's crying out of it, mm-hmm. that game would be a 10 out of 10. Like mm-hmm. it would be a game of the year contender. And I would love to see the contemporary aesthetic and the commitment to keeping these games chill blended with the genius of design Mm -hmm. that went into that one um whether but it's very rare you get a game that good i I hope it is one day looking at screenshots uh when i was prepping the story for the the 2019 yoshi game like it definitely is taking what uh woolly world kind of began and Mm -hmm. it it looks gorgeous like it has a very very beautiful look to it i just worry that the game isn't going to be what I want it to be, but hey, it's going to be what others do. So yeah, you can't win them all, Jared. I don't know. Who knows? Um, it could. For all you know, this could be the secret return to greatness that Yoshi has always needed. We'll see. We'll see. Um, going back to Liam's question, though, uh, like, do we expect to see more leaks? I I could see, like you said, the Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe uh, get leaked. I mean, it already kind of has gotten leaked a couple times, but mm-hmm. not by someone like Nintendo yet. Like, not on that level. What it, why can't I figure out how that game's going to work? This this is driving me crazy. So what New Super Mario, well, I still can't figure out how they're going to solve the interface problem. 
Uh, my favorite part of New Super Mario Brothers U is the ability of the fifth player to manipulate platforms using the pad. Mm -hmm. But that's not going to work if you have a docked station and you can't play multiplayer without the, either the dock station or no touch control on the table. So you're going to lose my absolute favorite part of that game. I feel like that's not many people's favorite part of the game. And really? Yeah. Oh. And I, I think more than that, though, we're already seeing with, uh, with things like Super Mario Party that Nintendo is okay making decisions of certain modes not working yeah. docked versus undocked versus having multiple switches and stuff. So perhaps they 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 will figure out a way. Of it's just that whole game was designed around those supplemental platforms. I mean, it's designed to be played without them, but every level is specifically designed to accommodate them and exploit them. Mm -hmm. And I feel like you're losing a critical element of one of the very best, and I, I don't think this is a bit of hyperbole, one of the very best Mario games of all time is going to lose one of its key elements. They'll figure it out. I have faith. I'm excited to replay through that game because I agree with you. It is it is a top tier Mario game that has not been played by enough yeah, people. Yeah, it's superb. So uh, is the original Wii version, by the way. Also spectacular. Next news story. This comes from Metro. THQ Nordic buys Kingdoms of Amalur. What? Sure, why not? What the fuck world do we live in? Uh, THQ Nordic has bought the rights to role-playing franchise Kingdoms of Amalur from 38 Studios and ex-baseball star Kurt Schilling. In further proof that no video game franchise is ever truly dead, <laughs> the rights to action role-player Kingdoms of Amalur have been acquired by THQ Nordic. Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning was originally published by EA in 2012 and was intended to be the first in a series of games by American Studio 38 Games, which was founded by former baseball star Kurt Schilling. The game was only a minor hit though and shortly after 38 studios was caught in a legal feud with the state of rhode island over a loan <laughs> fucking video games are weird do you know man. That, yeah do you know that whole story like that's just so a bizarre as a result the company was shut down and Schilling went back to being a sports pundit before being sacked by espn for his right wing comments thq nordic has been buying up lots of old never quite made it franchises lately though including red faction de blob darksiders and most recently time splitters and second sight so this is weird. I, I'm really waiting for THQ to just start announcing they're going to release all these things for GBA. Mm -hmm. I, when I when I think of THQ, that's all all like. Oh I my know, god, that's a really good point. Yeah, <laughs> it's just all like. If I see a Game Boy cartridge, I just see the THQ label like superimposed on it constantly. But now I I don't know. I mean, sure, it does have some name recognition. I. I I, maybe it's a finance decision. It is again. It's infinitely easier to walk into a room full of suits and show them, hey, this is how well this other thing with this same name did, so give us more money, than it is to go, here's a name you've never heard of with better ideas, but you're not gonna give us your money, are you? Because you have no, you've never heard of that. I mean, it could just but be a matter a, of that. It was a flop. Like, that's the thing that, like, this doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah, I think you just walk in and say, you got, you got it cheap, probably got it at a fire sale price, and you're like, hey, hey, look at all these daily active users. We know that this thing would have succeeded had it not been for this, this, and this, and you can approach it yeah. with that perspective. That's my guess. Did you I play mean, the original? Oh, my gosh. Um... I, I don't think so. Yeah, <laughs> it's been a really long time. I definitely didn't, but I know Greg Miller is a huge fan of it, and so this is bizarre think, news for sure. I might have played that. Is it bad that I can't remember anymore? I'm very no, old. because I mean, <laughs> so I, I was. A lot of people wrote in. Like a lot of people are excited about this and wrote in the kind of funny games daily uh, to to let us know their thoughts on it. And so many of the comments were like, "Oh, like everybody loves this game and it's beloved, and like no one has anything bad to say about it." And then a lot of the other comments were like, "It's probably the most forgettable whatever okay game ever created." Okay, um, yeah. and I don't know why people love it as much as they do. So I, I feel think like I somewhere tried it out, but my, it's just been. It's just been too long because we're not talking about recent history here. Mm -hmm. It's been a really, really, really long time. I'm going to I'm going to read a question here from Games of Steel. Doki Doki, Tim and Jared. I was going to ask for Greg's yelling voice, but Greg's not on Kind of Funny Games Daily today. I would like to request a happy yelling Jared voice, please. What am I being happy about? Oh, there we go. All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's all good. You ready? Mm hmm. Oh my stars in heaven, someone finally bought the Kingdoms of MLR Reckoning IP, and I am all tingly! 
I'll keep Second. it brief. Yes, it was. Okay. First of all, what is your dream Gatorade get hype scenario here? Do you want THQ Nordic to remaster the original game, create a sequel, create a brand new game using the elements of the lore, continue the MMO that was already in the works? Second, what do you think will happen realistically? What is THQ Nordic's smartest play here to benefit from this IP? Finally, do you think that THQ Nordic actually has the resources to create a high quality, rich RPG, or will we get something more mid-tier? Since the rebranding, they really don't have much of a track record yet. I think what you do is you create a solid, build a scope that is consummate with your resources, build the best probably mid-tier online thing you can around this, give it one or two really compelling hooks that distinguish it from what's out there and hopefully give it time to grow. That's, mm -hmm. I mean, I, that seems to, that's my guess as to where they're headed with this. Just run on the name and build something where you're like, well, we know that our research shows 100,000 people worldwide yeah. care enough about this to dive in day one. So build around that budget and then we'll see what happens. What do you think, Tim? I think it starts with a remaster. I think that that's the, the easiest bet to, to get out there. It will be the, the lowest cost of entry for them mm -hmm. to start making money off of this thing and to really get an even better sense of how much it's worth investing in in the future. Yeah. Having said that, I am not sure that them buying this means anything's gonna mm -hmm. happen. So being realistic, I think there's a chance nothing happens anytime soon. Um, the THQ, and to answer the final question, do they have the resources to create this? Look, on Games Daily and Games Cast, I feel like anytime we talk about THQ Nordic, we sound very down on it. Mm -hmm. We sound very negative about it, and it's always very snarky and sarcastic. Mm -hmm. But I feel like that's for a reason. <laughs> Well, it's because it's new. It's unproven. I mean, it's, it's new. A, it's unproven, and it just is ba like so many decisions they've made. And look, I, I'm not a game developer, so I could be totally wrong about this. If I were THQ Nordic, I would double down on what THQ means to so many people, mm -hmm. and really kind of own the hey man. We're trying to make some seven out of ten games reminiscent of the like how many games came out in the PS2 era. Uh -huh. And it's like we we're gonna give you Darksiders, we're gonna give you Kingdoms of Amalur, we're gonna give yeah. you time splitters, we're gonna like God, I want nothing more than new time splitters. But I'm not kidding myself. I understand that if we get a new time splitters, it's gonna be a fun little like thing to play around with, but it's not gonna be a breathtaking experience. No, I wonder about Kingdoms. The more I think about it, the more I wonder if this is headed to mobile, honestly. Hmm. Um, uh, because there's, there's really, a, the, the market for mobile MMOs has not been tapped as well as it could be. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think it's entirely possible to build a very good mobile MMO with relatively limited resources compared to what would go into the art on the AAA. I want to be clear launching any MMO is an act of insanity. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a ridiculously high cost, high risk proposition. But the rewards, if you are one of the few that makes it, can be great. Maybe they're thinking that we'll introduce the MMO that you can play on your phone. People have heard the name. And if we do it the right way, they'll actually dive in. Yeah. Just, Jared, how cool do you think it would be, though, if THQ was just like, THQ Nordic was like, yo, we're THQ. Mm -hmm. And we're just, we're going to just keep buying all these like more obscure Little properties. Well, I love stuff like that. I, I like niche publishing. I, I like when people are just catering to secondary markets. There are companies that do stuff like this. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at the way that NIS America operates, for example, and they're just like, you know what? We're going to give you your Disgaea. Mm -hmm. We're going to give you your collections. We're going to give you, you know, they, 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 they hit these high points and cater to a section of the market and they budget proportionally to that and they give me what I want. And I guess that's the thing is like, you know, we, we talked about this on Gamescast last week or so uh, about this retro resurgence happening and how it's at this point, like retro 2D platformers are kind of just a genre to themselves mm -hmm. and it's not yeah. really retro anymore. And we're now seeing what retro could be because video games have existed for so long oh, yeah. and like these are, this could kind of be the new retro i listen tim uh, yesterday i dug the literally dug an xbox 360 e out of the trash a few mm -hmm. days ago uh, someplace i was and um yeah uh, and what a statement <laughs> yeah and took it uh, took it home and brought it back to life and uh, so normally I play a lot of, you know, backward compatible stuff on Xbox One, but not every, even though they've supported that wonderfully, not everything's backward compatible. Mm -hmm. Sat down, played some Scott Pilgrim. Can't play that on Xbox oh, yeah. One. No. Played some, I uh, made Can't a game. Can't play that in most places. Made now. a game with zombies in it. Played mm -hmm. a couple of, you know. And I was like, 
you know what? These are retro games now. They mm-hmm. are a decade old. They are, you know, and that's fine. I'm having a ball playing some old games. And guess what? This was worth hauling out of the trash to do it. I think that there's plenty of other stuff in the trash bin of history that a mid-tier company like this can help make. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm good with this. Next news story. Red Dead Redemption character name reveals. This comes from Nick Santangelo from IGN. Rockstar Games is spending the morning rounding up its posse. Put another way, the developer is tweeting out names and quotes for some of the characters coming in Red Dead Redemption 2, including the central Dutch vendor. Dutch Vanderlin, Dutch Vanderlin. Uh, gang. The first new reveal was Susan Grimshaw, for whom Rockstar offered this line of dialogue. I swear half of you would just rot in your own filth if nobody kept you in check. Rockstar followed up with Molly O'Shea, whose quote is saying, you're playing a dangerous game. Those are the only new characters introduced so far, but Rockstar also gave shout outs to the previously revealed Hosea Matthews, Pearson, and Dutch Vanderland, the latter of whom is the leader of the gang. The gang leader, quote, Rockstar shared is, they're chasing us hard because we represent everything that they fear. Pearson's quote is saying the people are happy and well fed. I think perhaps we'll be okay. And Hosea Matthews quote is, I wish I had acquired wisdom at less of a price. It seems likely that more quote reveals, if not more name reveals, are still coming as Rockstar has continued tweeting out more characters while this story was being written. So go check out Rockstar's Twitter if you want to see more of that. Jared, you are the Red Dead guy. What's this mean to you? I'm very excited about this. Imagine that. Uh, Yeah, (laughs) no, I look, I... We've wanted to see more about these characters. I like this this approach. Rockstar is very, very good at giving us tastes. Mm-hmm. They, they are marvelous. Like, they, they ought to run. You know when you go into, like, a, a Costco or a Sam's Club and they have, like, the sample counter? And you walk through and you get oh, all yeah. the little samples? Yeah. I think Rockstar is in that business. They're just like, we'll give you just enough to tantalize and maybe you'll go and take the whole thing home. Mm-hmm. They don't spoil anything. They're never going to fill you up, never going to overdo that appetite. And, uh, yeah, so now we're like, oh, this character looks interesting. This quote, without explaining anything explicit, gives me something about their personality. What do we learned about this? We already know the gang is on the run. This is uh, f- doubling down on this will be a personalized story of a subcultural experiment gone wrong that's ultimately driven into the dirt by pursuing outside forces. This will be a story of chaos being run over by a very nasty kind of order. That is a very Western story. The idea of people trying to live a frontier life, gradually discovering the inevitable grind of civilization and conformity coming over them. And in a sense, it'll be like the movie Logan, I think, but it's going to be anti-heroes versus anti-heroes as opposed to one side being good and the other being bad. It's going to show the nasty of both of them. Really excited about that. They've leaned into this as a world that you're kind of an actor in, but you are not the mover and shaker of the universe. The fact that they're putting the focus on other characters besides Arthur makes me so happy. It plays into that exact arc that they've that they presented there already in that. This is a world to get interested in. These are people worth caring about. That's good marketing and followed through on. That's good game design. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Exciting stuff. Uh, if you want more on Red Dead Redemption. Go check out Red Dead Radio, Jared's Red Dead Redemption podcast. Yep. New episode um, going up Friday with uh, with our Red Dead Radio Live PAX panel. There so, you go. Yeah. Uh, next news story, Xbox now has Alexa and Cortana support. This comes from Joe Scrubbles at IGN. Uh, Microsoft is releasing an Xbox skill for Alexa and Cortana enabled devices, adding remote voice controls for Xbox One. Announced on Xbox Wire, the skill will allow you to turn your console on and off, launch games and apps, start and stop mixer broadcasts, control volume, control media playback, navigate menus, and capture screenshots and videos. The skill also bypasses steps, so if you tell your Amazon Echo to start a game when your console is off, it'll turn on the console, sign you in, and boot the game. The skill will be coming today to some members of the Xbox Insiders program in the U.S. with unannounced release dates for the rest of the world. To check if it's been added to your console, you can head to Settings on your Xbox One, then hit Devices. If you see Digital Assistant listed, you're good to go. I think it's cool that they killed the Kinect and are now finding ways, modern ways, Mm -hmm. to incorporate the things people liked about the Kinect back into the Xbox. Xbox, This is just even more signs of Xbox understanding it needs to be different and build a better future for itself with its next system mm-hmm. with services with features with you know things that are gamer focused that make the experience of using an Xbox even better than that uh, you, the, what you can find on a PlayStation 4 from a marketing and vision perspective i absolutely agree with you uh from a oh lord i don't want this thing in my house perspective i'm terrified Um, I have no use for for AI microphones in my home and life. Uh, I find 
the idea there's a reason that every science fiction movie ever made shows us that this is a terrible terrible future to build on uh generally speaking science fiction is appropriately prophetic they're very rarely wrong about this kind of thing and i don't at all like inviting microphones into my house so i can get something five cents cheaper Mm. uh i think it's a terrible precedent for all of us to set and that we surrender tremendous freedom for a little convenience in this and uh gradually uh, uh, erode our ability to make our own decisions and increasingly invite people to tell us what we want as opposed to searching for what we need. Um, that's my perspective on this as a haunting, frightening, good Lord, we're all going to die thing. She got uh, dark. But in terms of, hey, I want to sell you a console right now and give it more features. Mm-hmm. Seems to be what people want. Yeah. So there we go. Interesting stuff. Uh, Ethan Gawk has a, a hot take on this from Kotaku. He said, Microsoft, this is the entire article he wrote. Microsoft is rolling out Alexa support for Xbox One, starting with the Insider program. This new set of features called Xbox Skill works with the Echo and other Alexa Cortana-enabled devices and includes being able to power the system on. It doesn't yet include a voice command for getting more exclusives. Mm. <laughs> mm. That's Burn, bitches! I love that. Oh, Jared, it's going to be a long time until the robots take over. But if I wanted to know what games were in mom and grop shops today, where would I look? I'd look at the official list of upcoming software across each and every platform as listed by the kind of day. Oh, no. (laughs) Full flub. Full flub. (laughs) The kind of funny games daily show hosts each and every weekday. Do, 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 do. Fuck you, Horn. I have failed you. It's okay, man. Hey, we're, we're just rolling with the homies right now. Out today, Broforce on Switch. Gone home on Switch. Buy it. Buy it right now. Buy it if you've already played it. It's one of the best video games of the 21st century. Buy it. Play it. Don't Twist let anybody it. convince you Leave otherwise. It. Stop format it. Uh, Hyper Light Drifter on Switch. Andy Cortez is extremely excited about that. Kentucky Robo Chicken on Switch. <laughs> Not to be confused with Kentucky Route Zero. No idea what that is, but all right. (laughs) Those are very different things. Lifeless Planet Premiere Edition on Switch. And finally, Shikondo, Soul Eater on Switch. The secret. It's a big Switch Sequel to Sharknado. Yeah. Uh, Some new dates for you. This is a Cool Greg special. The Lego Harry Potter Collection, which consists of two last-gen games covering all seven Harry Potter books, is coming Xbox One and Switch on October 30th. It's been out for PS4 since October 2016. My brother is extremely excited about this. He 100%ed uh, the first Lego Harry Potter game. Yep. Never played the second one. So now he gets to take it with him on the go. When are we going to get that Harry Potter game worthy? I mean, the Lego games are actually great, but when are we going to get that one? A proper that the, the, Harry yeah. Potter game? Proper, I don't know. If Rock, fans. Rock said he's not making it, I don't think it exists. How is that possible? I don't know. Cool, Greg. Yeah. You hyped about the Lego Harry Potter games? Oh, man. Come with my Switch? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dude, I, don't use, sorry. I only use my Switch for Hulu, and I'm really excited <laughs> to actually use it for like what it's intended I'm sorry. For. Did you, you say I only use my Switch for Hulu? Well, it's at the Switch now. You're a bizarre character, my friend. Bizarre, I only use my Switch for Hulu is my new favorite thing anybody said <laughs> in the history of people saying things. It's time for Reader Mail. Uh, Reader Mail is brought to you by Third Love. Let me tell you about Third Love. Uh, you probably know somebody in your life that, that needs a bra. And you might not think that they need them, but trust me, it's, it's like underwear. It is underwear, technically. <laughs> Everybody needs it. Uh, perfect fit. Using thousands of real women's measurements, Third Love designs its bras with breast, breast size and shape in mind, so they fit impeccably and feel even better. The most sizes of any brand, Third Love just added 24 new sizes, making them the industry leader with a total of 70 sizes. Convenience. Skip the trip. Find your fit in 60 seconds online. Order and try on at home. No more awkward fitting room experiences. Gia uses it. She's been loving hers. She went in, and the 70 different sizes thing super helped her. She's kind of in the middle somewhere, and uh, a lot of times she can't find uh, bras that fit perfectly. This. She found one. She's loving it. Third Love has the most sizes of any bra band. Cups from A through H. Bands up to 48. Each size is designed specifically for a perfect fit. Third Love guarantees a perfect fit. Returns and exchanges are free and easy. G has a ton of friends that have been using this. They have glowing recommendations. They're big fans of the the nude colored ones because they say it blends in when you're wearing the white shirts. Um, but there's also a black lacy one that quote the guys like. What do you got for me, Nick? 
Oh, no, you can finish that. Okay, okay. Uh, Third Love guarantees a perfect fit. Like I said, returns and exchanges are easy. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone. So right now, they're offering listeners 15% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash games now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash games. T-H-I-R-D-L-O-V-E dot com slash games for 15% off today. It's... Can we just dedicate the rest of this? We got about 25 minutes of show left here on our average running time. Can we dedicate the last 25 minutes to I only use my switch for Hulu? I love Sorry, it. Jared. <laughs> I know you don't need to apologize. It's not. I, I, what is the only use of switch for? Hulu. Hulu. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. I, Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a great 4K screen on the switch, right? <laughs> what do you got for me? Is this. I got a message. I got oh, a message. A secret, secret message has come through here. Oh, my God. Outback Steakhouse. Yeah, Outback oh, I don't know. That's a good. Yeah. I mean, dude. It was just the message. It was a good message. What, I am why so why did he bring you Outback Steakhouse? I don't know the story. We're going to lunch. Yeah, you guys are going to lunch? Want to go to lunch at Outback Steakhouse. Yeah. Oh, Outback. That's, some good, that's some good food right there. Oh, my gosh. That's delicious. It's not bad. Yeah. It's not bad. No, no it's just, mail time. We don't have to. I'm just putting it out there. Well, yeah. The shitty lunch club has eaten there before. That's a... That's a <laughs> Have it. Tom Green writes in and says, Dear you guys, this is the hardest letter I've ever had to write. I regret to inform you that even though I have taken Friday off, I will not be able to watch Kind of Funny Games Daily Live, as I will more than likely be playing Marvel Spider-Man. I hope this letter finds you well and stocked fully with Frank's red sauce. Remember, don't forget to watch Greg's Instagram for a special cooking with Greggy with that, that <laughs> luscious corn and burger. Oh, and I actually do have a question. What's more satisfying, recalling the Leviathan Axe or web swinging? Oh, good question. Have you played any of Spider-Man? No. So I can't answer this question. Uh, Sp- I am Spider-Man free. Until tomorrow. Until okay. tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, yep. It's like choosing your favorite kid, which is impossible unless you're my mom. Um, I I really feel, though, at the end of the day, the Leviathan Axe is one of the most satisfying things in video game history. Yeah. Um, swinging a Spider-Man is amazing. And I feel the thing that makes it so special is the the music that plays the way that they handle the music and you'll you'll notice this when you play it it's so dynamic with what spider-man's doing when you run up a building there's moments of silence before mm. the, the the swell of when you're picking up momentum cool and it always feels exactly the right level of epic so just great sound design doing. the sound design makes you feel like spider-man i feel like that is the the key to making it it as special as it is uh because you know we've we've swung before in spider-man video games and mm-hmm. it's felt good uh i feel like this is the first time that it, it looks and sounds as good as it feels mm-hmm. and that creates the sensation of a unique feeling in a video game Super. and so it's a, it's magical but it's not the leviathan axe yeah. i feel like the leviathan axe is so uh, satisfying from even a gameplay perspective mm-hmm. that uh, it, it you'll never. I don't know that that can be beat. Oh, the wow. way that the controller rumbles when when it's like when coming it at you, the, like, tactile the way feel. That the sound design of that as well, like everything about it. It's I get chills talking about it. Oh, that's rad. But, yeah, I'm it's that, it's special. It's special. Jay Black. 2886 says, when reviewing a game today, it seems 7 to 9.5 is the average spectrum of viewers score games. Would you agree the gap should be widened? Are games consistently really that good? And if so, when does a 7 become a 6 and a 9 become an 8? Thank you. Go Pack Go. Oh, I just did a review. This uh, this comes to mind. I did a review of Dragon Quest for IGN recently. Uh, and... You keep this stuff on your mind a lot. Mitch Dyer uh, at IGN used to joke that the review scale should be garbage or not garbage. Mm-hmm. Um, that uh, that sometimes he felt like that was the only two things people ever took away from those. I, I tend to perform a little more nuanced scale. I think if I had my own... My <laughs> a little own, more nuanced than garbage or not garbage. But like if I did my own scale mm-hmm. uh, for reviews, it would be bad, meh, good, great. Mm-hmm. Those would be the, the four I'd have. Uh, and uh, I think that a lot of people tend to break things down into three or four like that, or that binary garbage, not garbage thing. Every outlet has different guidelines, and a lot of people don't pay attention to those guidelines and how they differ from outlet to outlet because they think about Metacritic. All Metacritic is is a tool of convenience that grabs numbers that don't ex- mean exactly the same thing. You know, an, an 8.8 at one outlet and an 88 at another outlet are not the same because those outlets have different guidelines for what those numbers are supposed to mean. For IGN, 
Anything in the eights is great. Anything in the nines is amazing. And that is a guideline. A person is literally thinking about their interpretation of those words, among many other factors, Mm -hmm. and going, well, where does this fall? Uh, I rated Dragon Quest uh, an 8.8 because it's really great. And I wanted to make sure I conveyed that not only is it great, but man, it is just spectacularly great. But is it something that just like is amazing that's going to bowl me over or change the way I think about video games? It did not do that. It's one mm-hmm. of the best games I played all year, but it didn't revolutionize my mind. So I stayed away from that amazing yeah. uh, tag there. And that was one of the things that comes up. Are games consistently that good? I think the video game industry across all outlets if we're looking at, at how the numbers are usually high, yeah, I think games are largely pretty good, the ones we bother to review. And I think that's the key to this whole thing of should the scale be explored more from the you know the one to six side. I think the at the end of the day, majority of video games that are chosen to be reviewed by sites like IGN and, and, and whatnot are the ones that are of a certain level of polish that are gonna get them into that seven or above. Budget polish level. distribution. Yeah. And so there is a ton of bad games, ton of them that would get a three, but mm-hmm. IGN's just not reviewing them. Yeah, they used to. I mean, it used to be, you know, they tried to review practically everything. Mm-hmm. That's impossible not for an outlet of that size. It was not was not sustainable. Well, and, and more than that, there wasn't as many video games coming out back then. Yeah. You know, it's like they're, now it'd be insane. It, it's impossible, with the, especially with Indian stuff. But And especially since they really do try to have a high standard of, of review, you know, look, play through the whole game. And yeah. if you don't declare to people that you have, you know, let mm-hmm. them know that you didn't finish it. There's a long standard of things that they want to make sure they get right and not rush through these. But I do feel like, you know, we're, we're in a great place now where video games, I believe, are genuinely and generally at this level between 7 and 9.5 because there is an understanding of what makes a good game and uh, game developers are good at making good games. Yeah. Now, I've given pretty low scores. I, I, I hate giving a bad review to a game. Or, mm-hmm. Pardon me. I hate telling people a game is bad through a review. I think that's the better way to put it. Uh, I, I had to, to savage a couple of games that I really wanted to like mm-hmm. uh, because they weren't fun and they didn't work well. I, and I think that going to what we're saying of like there's there's almost an expectation of of how good the games are going to be, and it's surprising when games aren't in this range. Mm-hmm. And it reminds me of Devil May Cry two. Yeah, with how amazing Devil May Cry one was, and like I would I would give it. I mean, at least, you know, this is nostalgia speaking, but like at the time I would have given that a nine, yeah, maybe a nine five even. And uh, I was so excited for Devil May Cry 2. And then playing through that game, I, the review, so many reviews were like this, like between a four and a six. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, how is that possible? And then when I played through it, I'm like, man, it, it really is in that range. Yeah. And that was a big deal because that was a big game. I, I love Nintendo games. I love their creativity. I, I had to give Paper Jam a pretty low score. Paper Jam and, wasn't good. And uh, it wasn't, Color Splash wasn't good. And it was not good. And Mario Power Tennis or whatever on the Wii U wasn't good. Star Fox Zero, I think we disagree about this, Yeah, I, wasn't good. I, I, I'm a little warmer on Star Fox Zero than you are. Mm-hmm. But, but And again, isn't good. That's our opinion. That's our informed opinion, though. It's a hypothesis. It's a lot like... It's not a hypothesis, but you know how people talk about the scientific method and they start with, you know, question. You're trying to find something out. Hypothesis, educated guess. Mm -hmm. If a hypothesis is an educated guess where you're not just taking a wild shot, you're like, here's all the information I have so far, I'm going to guess. Then you test your guess. Video game reviews are like the opposite. They are educated answers. Mm -hmm. They They are not the end all be all. They are an educate at their best an educated opinion. Mm-hmm. They are. I have s- sat down with this game, spent a lot of time with it, analyzed what makes it work and not work, and now I'm conveying that information to you. Most importantly, with the idea of is this fun? Mm-hmm. A lot of people when they write reviews provide a lot of deep information on what the game is. Uh, writing for IGN, that's less a part of it. Dan is very big on. I want you to tell me why this game is fun or why it's not. And he kind of levels in on that. Other outlets will go a little more explanatory. And yeah. there are virtues to each of those, by the way. I, I'm not. Well, it's crazy. I mean, that, that's grown over time. Like, if you read older IGN reviews, even like maybe eight years ago, mm-hmm. read a review, 
and it kind of reads like the back of the box of a video game. It's telling you what the game is. Yeah, yeah. and there there is some virtue to that to providing context mm-hmm. uh, that that I appreciate as well, and some other outlets do lean into that more. But ultimately, you are going there to find out whether or not you want to buy this, mm-hmm. whether or not you want to play this. Uh, of all the things I do in this industry, reviews are the things I think I take mo- with the most gravity because they are reader service. Somebody's going to lay down their. I'm a talking head. You know, we, 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 we care about what we do a lot, but we're goofballs. We're idiots. We're dummies. We, we take off our shirts and run around. But when somebody's going to plop down their money on something, you probably want to make sure you get it as right as you know how. And, yeah, that's, and that's why this diff- that's where the difference between a six and a seven comes from. And to answer to your question, I sit down and I go, look, I need to give you the best impression I can of whether or not you want to spend your money on this. Yeah. And so I try to decide whether you want there's a six that you want to spend your money on it or, or you know, a seven. I'm making a note. I want to do a games cast topic coming up. Uh, and I feel like we've done this before, but I want a new version of how should games be reviewed in, okay. in 2018? I like that. I think that'd be a great deal of fun. Uh, I'd, I'd like to be on that one. Yes. yes so yes, yeah, yes. I'm hardly a master reviewer. My reviews tend to be short. Um, and uh, I try to keep them very concise, but I, I do like it. Do you like reviewing? I've never done a, a like a review in the like IGN sense and, and yeah. that type of thing. For me, it's usually just more like this t- like podcasty type stuff where mm-hmm. I'm just like... Uh, just giving my opinion on stuff, and I like—I kind of like keeping it there. You know, uh, when games come out, I—I'll I, put out like a Twitter review or something, and that's the most concise version of, of what you're trying to say. But I'm—I'm I'm a bigger fan of the process than I am of the numbers. I guess you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. I, I would rather just talk about a video game than. Uh, get into the nitty gritty stuff because like I don't think that I am the right person to be coming to but I feel like if people Agree with the type of games I like then I want to let them know I liked this or didn't like that or whatever it is about the game You know, I like that. I, I appreciate that deeply again There's a lot of ways to go about this It's more the the gravity that goes into it and the thoughtfulness than the actual final method I think mm-hmm. that makes the difference. Did you see Kotaku's review of Dragon Quest 11? No, I didn't it's like 35 minutes long Oh my god! Uh, it's a thir- like a 35 minute video no score and just, you need to watch this. Even if you don't care about Dragon Quest really? at all, it's amazing. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I'll check it out. Let's see. Um, what we got here? Sonorith says, hey, Gettys and Patty. Love <laughs> episodes with you two. As a fledgling reviewer, I received smaller titles like Into the Breach a few days before release. And that's Woo-hoo! obviously pretty exciting. But I've yet to earn a AAA game. And so my question is this. Does playing, and ideally completing, a AAA game like Spider-Man or Mario Odyssey, Wolfenstein 2, and Assassin's Creed Origins uh, take away from your excitement for the release date? Greg says he already got the Platinum Trophy for Spider-Man, and I can't help but feel that it removes or hinders that release day buzz. Would love to hear your thoughts on the matter. For me, uh, I can only speak for myself, it changes the release day buzz. It does Mm -hmm. not remove it, but my job on release day is very different. I have different things to be excited about. I am not excited about my first experience anymore. I'm excited about your first experience and being a part of that. I have the best job in the world. I get to share joy and fun with people for a living. And I get to be there in the middle of your life in this very weird, wonderful way while you're having a great time with something. So for me, the anxiety doesn't become, man, I wanna see what Spider-Man's like. It's gonna be like, oh my gosh, all of them are about to see what Spider-Man's like, and I get to be a tiny part of it, and that's where the excitement comes from. What about you, Tim? Yeah, I, I think you're right. You know, video games, especially these kind of temple ones, they're all about those water cooler moments, and we're lucky that we get to be surrounded by people that are usually experiencing the thing at the same time, even if it's before the release date. Yeah. So it's not so much thinking about, uh, like, for example, Spider-Man is a perfect use case of this where Greg Miller's is it September 7th yet campaign that he's been doing with the shirtless Spider-Man stuff. It's like, yeah, we got the game uh, a week or two ago. I don't remember at this point, but uh, it, it didn't matter. And I, a lot of people were tweeting at, at Greg like, like, oh, are you talking about September 7th? You get it early. It's like, it's not about that. It's about the the excitement for it. And th- September 7th then becomes a new uh, exciting moment for, for Greg because now then he gets to have that conversation with everybody about the cool moments and the cool things that he got to experience. Uh, we're lucky that we get to come to this office and every morning me and Greg would 
go into a different room and close the door so we're not spoiling it for the people that haven't played yet and just be like oh my god like did you get to this part like holy shit this thing's cool did you collect that thing like how do you feel about this story development like whatever having those conversations it reminds me of watching game of thrones and going into the office the next day and having that like breakdown conversation um it's on a wider scale when it gets yeah. released to the public and then you get to kind of have that conversation with everybody else or at least watch the conversations happening and, and, all, and all of that. Yeah, I, I, folks, I, no joke, okay? This is this is not humble brag or anything else. Our jobs are just as cool as you think they are. They Absolutely. Are, they're a lot of work, but good Lord, it's wonderful to be able to be a part of so many people's joy. Mm-hmm. As Stephen King put it in Joyland, there is nothing better in the world than selling fun. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what we do. Totally. And and that's the thing. Is, <laughs> and it goes back to the last question where we're lucky that most games that we're playing are good yeah. now. So it, it, it is fun. It is exciting. And the release date gets really hard, especially when it's when it's far out because you're like, fuck. I, all I want to do is talk about this game and I can't, mm-hmm. you know, like having to like lock ourselves in rooms to like not spoil things for people like that's that's hard when all we want to do is yell from the rooftops the cool things. Yeah, you know, but you, you got to save that for them too. That's the other bit. And that's good. It. And it's, it's, it's a wonderful bounce. And sometimes we do are completely. I mean, I've had several opportunities to play Spider-Man and I haven't. So yeah. sometimes I do get to be surprised by things and that's exciting as well. I, I'm looking forward to that. Also, before we move to the next thing, Tim, mm-hmm. I forgot to tell you, I'm salty about something. What you salty about, what, Jared? You want to put it at the end or uh, in the other spot? But real quick, yeah, let's put it at the end. It's time to squat up, everybody. This comes from Matt G on PS4. His uh, PSN name is CCMG12. CCMG12. He says, Spider-Man's almost here. I'm frantically trying to get the platinum on Ghost Recon Wildlands, and I'm only four away, two being the online trophies. If you can help me get them, that'd be awesome. I have a one-year-old daughter, so gaming is usually during nap time or after she goes to bed, and a mic generally isn't an option. So if that's all cool with you, hit me up. I'd greatly appreciate it. Also, if you just want to chat games and stuff, I'm always down to adding more friends. Thanks, KFGD crew and best friends. So go help out Matt G before Spider-Man. We're running out of time here. Squad up. Now it's time for You're Wrong. You're wrong. You guys can write in to kindoffunny.com slash you're wrong. Let us know what we get wrong during the show. Um, let's see. Here we go. We did today. Boom. Um. There's a lot of stuff that I'm like. Down, down, really confused by. Down, 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 down. There's accompanying music coming from Bionic Commando, the previous best game about swinging around. Uh, uh, the ass captain. <laughs> oh. Uh, writes and says, something that got missed on release date updates, Surgeon Simulator CPR Switch is coming out on the 13th of September. Oh, there we that go. announced today. Excellent. Cool. Glad to hear that. Surgeon Simulator's neat. Uh, also, uh, uh, in breaking news, Cool Greg only uses the Switch to watch Hulu. That is that is true as well. And then people are saying that uh, we Greg and Gary talked about the review question yesterday. There we go. Sorry for repeating that. Well, I did not know that. It's what I get for not listening to Kind of Funny Games Daily each and every weekday. And then finally, Parker Petrov says, Carbine Studios, the developer of the MMO Wildstar, is shutting down. 50 people will lose their jobs. The game will also be shut down. This is being reported by Kotaku's Jason Schreier shortly after KFGD went on the air. Shoot, that sucks. Always very unfortunate news. That sucks. Good luck to all of them. Hopefully, they land on their feet. Yep. Jared? Yes, sir. What you salty about? I'm just salty about one thing. I told you about getting that uh, Xbox 360E out of the trash and playing my Scott Pilgrim. Yes, yes, you did. So I've done got spoiled by this Xbox One backward compatibility. Thank you, Major Nelson. Thank you, good people at Microsoft for making that happen. But good Lord, somebody get Scott Pilgrim someplace we can play it. Like Switch. Mm. Had a best friend reach out to me this morning. Like, we need to start a campaign to get Spot Pilgrim versus the world on Switch. It's a perfect Switch game. It's a four-player brawler with ridiculous depth, beautiful graphics, still plays wonderfully. It's one of the best four friends on a couch games that you can play from last generation. Be very well suited to that platform. I hereby declare a hunger strike. Oh, it's not I will well. not eat. Oh my God. Until the licensing issues are worked out and Scott Pilgrim versus the world, the video game, is on Nintendo Switch or until I get hungry. 
One Ryan, of those two. Ryan Lee O'Malley, the creator of Scott Pilgrim, wants this just as bad as you do. Yeah. And it's not happening. Can so. we get Ryan Lee O'Malley, the creator of Scott Pilgrim, Brian, in here? Brian yeah. Lee did O'Malley? I say Ryan? I meant to say Brian. He's so. got. He's a private dude. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if we can get him. Can on. we hear the bag over his head? I don't know. I probably not. <laughs> yeah, like that wonderful yeah. joke on The Simpsons where Tom Pinchon. He, he's has my the, friend's boyfriend. True story. True, true fucking story that I, I can't believe is real. Uh, I, I met my friend at a Comic Con party years ago, and uh, she was cos- her and her friend were cosplaying as Envy Adams from Scott Pilgrim. Right. Years later, she finds him on Tinder. No kidding. Randomly was like, "That's fucking Brian Lee O'Malley." Wow. Yeah. No kidding. They true still story. date. Still, it's been years. Wow, that's really still cool. together. That's a warm story. Shout Love out that. to Love. Gotta love Love. Okay, shout, shout out, to, out love. to Love. Yep. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been kind of Funny Games Daily. Thank you for joining us. Uh, tomorrow, our hosts are Greg Miller making his return and Belinda Garcia from Geeks of Color will be oh, making cool. her kind of Funny Games Daily debut. We met her at RTX. She is awesome. You got a good episode ahead of you guys. Uh, enjoy Spider Man tonight when you download that shit. Preload it now. Get it ready to go. You're going to have a good time. Also, don't forget to watch Hulu on your Switch. Until next time, I love you.